But the three-part structure, okay, is in a three-minute test would be what happened in your life before Christ, like BC, <laughs> and then what was your experience of Christ? How did he change your life? And then what happened after Christ or your life in Christ? That's the general structure and trying to keep that evenly balanced. We'll look at that, the details of that later on. Why should we do this? Isn't the gospel just enough? Why do we have to talk about our own personal lives? Well, the truth is that Jesus did this with his apostles. He sent them out, and what did they talk about? I saw him die, right? I saw him rise from the dead. I, I, I saw him. I, it, this was my experience. They were witnesses to the resurrection. That's how he chose the apostles, and that's how they chose who could take the place of the other apostles, right? They had to have been witnesses of the resurrection. Personal experience was a qualifier. So that means that they, as witnesses, were sharing Christ's death and resurrection, the objective gospel, but it was almost the same thing as sharing their own personal experience, because they were there, right? The subjective and the objective are, are almost joined in the apostles. Now, we don't have that luxury, right? We weren't there, right, at the death of Jesus. <laughs> But we can share of how that's affected us even 2,000 years later. Just show that Jesus is alive today. Okay? That's why we need our testimony. Because we are qualified by our experience of Christ. And this is a way of answering the question, why do you do all this? Our witness in the world, why are you, you know, going to church on, on Sunday and then going during the middle of the week? Why do you pray so much? Why do you have all these holy pictures in your office, you know? <laughs> then you can share, well... Let me, let me share about how Christ has touched my life. It answers questions that people have. And this is so powerful. When you share your testimony, unchurched people, people who might not even darken the door of a church, will, will they'll listen. They'll be like, yeah, because they're interested in you. So if they're interested in you, they have a friendship with you, they know you, then they'll be interested in what's happened in your life. And it's really non-threatening because people are willing to, to hear a story of, well, you know, what happened today or what happened last week or what, you know, tell me a story. They, they don't, might be turned off to the idea of having someone grab a Bible, right, and say, you know, uh, whack, you know, <laughs> hit them over the head with the Bible, you know, it's like, oh, you know, and suddenly you have the Bible and they run away, right? <laughs> so you put the Bible down, right, you hide it underneath your desk and then you just share about your life and you kind of sneak in, you know, <laughs> how God has worked in your life in a testimony. It's also personal. It's evidence that God is real and he's active and working in the lives of Christians today. He's not just someone who existed 2,000 years ago. And people will be able to relate to some aspect of your experience. They might say, wow, you know, I was, I was kind of in that kind of place before. Other people might say, well, I can't really relate to that. But another person comes along with a different testimony and says, oh, well, I can relate to his, right? If you're working in a team, sometimes it can be helpful to know each other's testimony, sort of, right? And you're talking to someone like, Oh, maybe you should talk to Frank, you know, I think he might have something to share that might, maybe you could relate to, you know. So in our testimony workshop, we actually all gave our testimonies to one another as a team of seminarians and priests. Thirdly, it stirs up interest and questions that go on further. When you share some things, they might ask, well, what was that like? Or how, do, how, can, I, how can I get in on that? And then they might pursue something further. And there's this desire for God that can awaken in people when you share how he's worked. A testimony is something that's hard to refute. Remember how Andy said, you know, look, it happened, and I was totally against it, and it still happened, right? It's hard to refute that. It's not like a teaching where you might have certain points that someone could agree with or disagree with. People basically are seeing you, and you're saying, well, this is what happened to me, and how can they say, no, it isn't, you know? Well, I, I was there. Were you there? You know, it's like you have some kind of credibility. If they trust you, then they're going to trust your experience. They might differ on what the, your interpretation of the experience was, okay? But that it happened or that something happened is hard to refute. And finally, God works through your testimony. And as you're sharing, he offers graces of conversion for those who are listening. In 
the last book of the Bible, Revelations, it speaks of the power of God working through the words of believers. It says, I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have salvation and power come. Now have the authority, the reign of our God and the authority of his anointed one. For the accuser of our brothers, the enemy of our salvation, is cast out, who night and day accused them. They defeated him, how? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The blood of the lamb, that would be the objective gospel, the death of Christ, how it sa he saves us. And then the word of their testimony is saying how that changed my life. And also speaking the word about who Christ is. So your, the, your testimony has power, and if you're willing to share it, then you can contribute something completely unique to the plan of evangelization, to God's plan to bring his message to the whole world. So when can you do this? Well, you can share it almost in any situation. It's very versatile. In a small group, in a conversation, as part of a talk, you've seen that happen here already, to friends, family, or strangers. The real issue is not when I want to share it so much as when they need to hear it, okay? It's not like I'm trying to force it, you know, like Father Scott was sharing. It's like, they've got to hear this, they've got to know this, and they better change, and that's a little bit much of self. It's as a servant, would this help them? Would this really be something that they... Uh, would benefit from. That's the criteria in your discernment. And then following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You might just be planting a seed for later conversion. You might not have a, you know, close the sale, so to speak, with the testimony, you know, and kind of complete this whole process of evangelization, but you might start it. You might get someone interested who's willing to do something else, take that next step. Because God's word doesn't go forth from his mouth empty or in vain but it accomplishes the work that he sent it for. And if you are speaking of how God has changed your life, I think in a way that this applies to your testimony. It will not go out empty or vain, but something will happen, maybe underneath the soil, <laughs> that you can't see the work of the spirit in the person's heart. We can't judge that. We can only see what's kind of coming out the top, but we can trust that God is working underneath the soil. And if we share our testimony with joy, with conviction, then God will use it for his kingdom. So I'd just like to give a, an example of this, invite Jeff to come forward. He's going to share a bit. You'll get a chance to, to see how God has worked in his life. So good afternoon. My name is Jeff, as Father Terry said. Um, I grew up in rural New Brunswick. Uh, I was the eldest of four children. As a boy, I was fairly shy, kind of an indep independent person. And I was also very eager to please. I remember when I was seven or eight, I joined the local softball team. You really, when you're in a small town and you get a chance to play softball, you get really excited because finally there's people to play with. We had uniforms and all. And uh, I was one of the youngest and smallest players on the team, and so consequently I really wasn't that good. But I knew that, and I wasn't really worried because I went to learn how to play softball. As time went on, I stopped getting called for practices, and if I managed to find out when a game was, I had to sit on the bench. So it started to dawn on me. I really wasn't wanted because I wasn't good enough. And you know, I never really, at that time, I never wanted to feel that way again. So my strategy was, I'm going to play it safe from now on. I'll only do what I'm good at, and that way, I'll never be disqualified. I'll never feel this feeling again. And this affected my relationship with God. I stopped asking him for him for help, or I reluctantly went for him to him for help. I always wanted to go to him good and being enough. As I played it safe, I succeeded. Whatever I tried, I succeeded in. My classmates looked up to me. My teachers thought well of me. And so I th thought I had figured it out. By the time I reached young adulthood, that's when the crisis happened. I entered a real long period of suffering and trial in my life. I really wanted to do worthwhile things all throughout life. I became a youth minister for a time. I became an elementary school teacher. 
But no matter what I tried, that feeling haunted me, that I wouldn't be good enough, my lessons weren't good enough, that I wouldn't have enough energy and time to, to meet all the demands. And so I became really sad and discouraged, and I started to sort of withdraw. I just, again, I was going to try to play it safer, even one more degree of safety. And it just, well, it didn't help. Eventually, I tried to do something completely different. I talked to a friend about it. It was that one evening I just told him the whole story, my, all my fears and my worries. It was probably the hardest and most embarrassing thing I ever had to do because I had never really faced my weaknesses before. And I figured, well, I don't know what good is this, this has done. I've told you everything, but what's it going to It's going to take something huge to change my life of do-it-myself habits. I've just been doing everything on my own. He says, well, let's pray for a miracle then. I said, all right. He suggested I pray the rosary. <laughs> that idea at the time just completely repulsed me. I was angry. It was like, a rosary, a little prayer. How can a little prayer meet such a big need? We're talking about a lifetime of needs here. But I, like I said, I tried most things on my own, so why not? I began to pray alone in my room that night. I could hardly remember the words, but I managed to get it out. And as I began to pray, tears began to flow. I began to sigh deeply, deep, taking deep, deep breaths. It was as I was taking in a whole lifetime of help I had never asked for. And then and there, a huge change, a huge burden was lifted. In that one moment, a whole lifetime was changed. My life with the Lord also changed. I started to experience him in a whole new way. I could talk to him in a whole new way. I could ask him for help. Now, I've also noticed a change in my life to this moment. I still expect I'll encounter mistakes and I'll make mistakes and I'll fail and all that sort of stuff. But there was now a courage that came from the Lord. So at the beginning, I always wanted to go to him having enough. Now I can't go to him enough. Thanks. Now we'll just invite up David to share his testimony. And, and then I'll come back with, uh, with some. That's, that was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, very much, Jeff. It's beautiful to see how the human heart is exposed in the testimony. It takes a lot of kind of guts to share in this way, but uh, especially with a big group. So I, I really uh, salute you for that. Just invite David to come forward. So as Father Terry said, my name's Dave. I, I guess as a child, I grew up in Toronto, but my family lives in New Brunswick now. So Jeff and I have identical testimonies. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a, I guess you would say, very strong Catholic family. I can remember very often praying together with the family. I went to conferences like this all the time with my parents. My parents led music. Surprise, surprise. And I can remember when I was seven or eight years old, I, would, I really loved sports. We loved, you know, going out and just doing what little boys my age did, you know, having fun. And... I'd always kind of wondered why my dad wouldn't come play hockey with me or baseball or whatever. And I would, you know, start getting really nervous about this because I would see other, other kids' dads come and do things with them. But my dad didn't seem to be able to, to come anytime I wanted him to come. Now, I realized later that it was because my dad was sick at the time that he couldn't do these things with me. But I basically grew up thinking that I had to do something to impress my dad, that something was wrong with me. He wasn't coming because I wasn't good enough, so I had to be the best I could in order to impress him. And without knowing it at the time, I took that image I had of my earthly father and I placed it on God the Father. And so I grew up relating to God the Father as God who I have to impress, I have to earn his love. And so I would get really upset at myself any time I would fall into any sort of sin, no matter how great or how small, because I would feel like, oh, I've let him down. He's not going to love me anymore. And it was a real bondage that I was, and I didn't know how to break free of it. And a few months ago, I was on a retreat 
uh, with the seminarians, um, and we were doing this retreat. On one of the days during the retreat, I was supposed to do this meditation, and the Lord just kind of brought to mind a scripture from Psalm 103. As the heavens tower over the earth, so my love towers over the faithful. And at that point, I just saw God the Father just as this loving father, and I saw myself as a little baby, and he picked me up, and he held me to his chest, and he started speaking words of love to me, how much he loved me. And then he said, now, David, I want to go with you one by one through all the memories of your father where every time that he loved you and cared for you and showed you affection. And so one by one, I started going through them all, and I was just started weeping because I realized for the first time my dad really loved me when I was younger. I knew, you know, I, I knew he did, but I just, I couldn't find these concrete examples. And it's just this whole wave of just times my dad really showed love to me. And I realized he'd always been impressed with me and had always loved me. And then the father started speaking words of love to me, saying, David, I love you. You are my child. I am impressed by you if for no other reason but the fact that you're my baby. And I really felt the Father just kind of towering over me, just protecting me. And I felt for the first time really loved by him, just for who I was. I didn't have to do anything to impress him. And from that time, there has been a real freedom in my life. I no longer go to prayer thinking I have to do this list of things in order to impress God, to seek his approval. Nor do I really beat myself up when I fall into sin. I recognize that I'm weak, but I still know that God is going to love me nonetheless. He's going to love me whether I'm the vilest sinner or the purest saint. And I really have experienced the freedom of the children of God. I, I know his love. And so I would encourage you to really ask God, the Father, to show you how much he loves you. Because God loves each and every one of us with an incredible love. Thank you very much. Beautiful. This is the God that we have. He's real, he's active, he's powerful, and you can see his hand in the lives of those who know him. This is the power of a testimony. Now, we can gaze in awe and wonder of, of what God has done in people's lives, but let's also, again, I'm gonna have to make it, unfortunately, practical, <laughs> and say, how do the, how do we share that in an effective way? Did you notice that both of those testimonies were fairly short? They were, you know, three, four, or five minutes. Because, why that short? So that they can be fit into a conversation. If I have a half hour story, it's like, I can't just sort of slip it in there, right? So a short testimony makes it very versatile. But if you flip over to your testimony checklist, we can see how do we use that short amount of time effectively. In order to do it, you have to plan. You have to think about what you're going to say. And this is what we're going to work on as a workshop. You're going to be breaking up into small groups and going through this testimony checklist and working on your testimony in pairs and as a small group and practicing them. Okay? So first of all, to get started, we have to ask ourselves, how has God worked in my life? What are some moments in my life where I experience the Lord? If I've asked him for help, how did he respond? What's different about my life because I have faith in God? These questions can, can point to places in your life to look to mine, if you will, for examples in your testimony. And oftentimes a theme will come out in your life from the experience. That of your life. For instance, in Dave's testimony, he went from, a, it was a theme of impressing God, God's love, God only loves me if I'm good, to God's love is unconditional. So there's this transformation to move from one image of God to another. Other uh, examples of testimonies, uh, in my testimony, I have an issue with where I was in control of my life and I could handle it, and then I realized that I wasn't in control of my life, <laughs> and, and then I said, I want God to be in control of my life, or Jesus to be in control. So you see how there's a progression, but it's all following a certain theme. If you don't do this, you'll end up with an illogical, illogical testimony. Like, when I was four, I used to, or when I was a kid, I used to beat up my, my sister for everything, you know? And, and then I went to this retreat, and they talked about how God loves us, and, and you know, how we should really be kind to our neighbor, and so on, and, and wow, that really hit me to the heart, and now, 
I get really good grades in school. <laughs> You're like, well, what about your sister? Like, is she dead on the side of the road somewhere? <laughs> like, what, what happened, right? It, you didn't bookend it. You have to kind of have an example on the, on the other side that, that matches, that closes the open parentheses you started in the beginning of your testimony. So uh, unforgiveness to forgiveness, searching for love to experiencing God's love, uh, being alone to having fellowship. All of these things show this contrast and they're along the same theme. So if you divide it up, you ideally want one minute in your life before, one minute of the experience of God and one minute of the life after. The life before, it's good to say a little bit about your background. What kind of family did you grow up in? Um, good things about your life, kind of what your life was like, so that you don't paint it all as, oh, it was horrible, evil, terrible, and then suddenly now it's all great, boo, and the birds are fluttering, and it's like, wow, <laughs> get real, you know? It's like there were good things about your life before Christ, and there can still be struggles after. So we need a, a balance, but you need to identify some kind of problem area, something that was missing or that needed to be changed. And in that, you want to give concrete examples. Did you notice how concrete the examples were in the testimonies you just heard? It wasn't just I was, uh, I had this feeling about who God was. It was, I remember when I went to the ball game and my dad wasn't there. You see how it's a picture? You can almost imagine somebody with the glove and kind of looking around all alone, you know? You paint a picture with your words so that it's concrete. And then you might have you know, one or more examples like that in your testimony. It grounds it in reality. It's not just abstractions. This captures the interest of those who are listening to you. You might use humor and come up with interesting ways of saying what you're trying to get across. Vivid language, something that people can relate to. Then you move into the center point of your testimony, which is actually the most important part, which is how God intervened or worked in your life. Now this could be a point of conversion, it could be, uh, or it could be a process that happens over time. Sometimes people have trouble because it was kind of a, can't think of one moment, right? Well, you can maybe think of a lot of different little things, try to identify one and build your testimony around that. But some questions you wanna answer in your testimony about that moment were, what were the circumstances that caused you to turn to God for help? And then what, was the issue you were struggling with, and how uh, did you surrender that to the Lord? What did you say? What did you feel? What was going on in your mind? What did you do? Concrete. And what did the Lord do or say, or inter how did he influence you? And the, the focus here turns to Jesus, not just I did this, I did that, but somehow highlighting the Lord's action in your life. Then, from that, you move into the life after. And this is concretely explaining the differences between your life before and your life after. Uh, and oftentimes, you want to avoid you know, this black and white that everything was horrible and that everything's great thing. But you need to, maybe it could be a process kind of language. That day, th this began for me, or I started to do this, or I, I noticed a change in my life. Something along those lines. That way you're not getting the per impression that your life is perfect now. And you want to give people a sense of where you're at with the Lord now. Depending on your circumstances, maybe they know where you're at with your, the Lord now, but you know, in sort of the, the perfect testimony, you know, or the, the, the testimony that's complete, you would, you would say, well, this is where I'm at today or you know, more recently. And optionally, you can add a closing uh, invitation, something that would direct what happened in your life and try to apply it to those who are listening. David did this at the end of his testimony by saying, you know, if you're in this situation, you can, you can ask God um, to show you his love for you. That's applying it to everyone else and inviting them to take, take an action. You might quote a scripture at that point. So, we want to focus on Jesus in our testimony, describe not just events in your life, but God's action in your life. You want to have a clear balance between the before, the during, and the after. Sometimes it can be very easy to overemphasize. Usually it's overemphasizing the before. 
I was bad. I was really, I was in the gutter. I was so far in the gutter. Let me tell you how much sewer stuff I was drinking. You know, like, it's like, okay, you know, <laughs> you know, too much information. You know, like, <laughs> there's, there's got to be a limit there. So, and that can take away from what, how much time you have to share about God's action or what's going on in your life now. So, being clear, accurate, and concise, ABC, audible, brief, and Christ-centered. These little ways of trying to focus in so you don't overemphasize certain things. And avoid giving a mini teaching, which means using uh, an example of a uh, kind of a lots of points and objective truths. You want to keep it as a personal sharing and not switch into another mode of teaching or starting to explain a whole series of Bible passages or something like that. You also want to avoid the travel log, which is, you know, when I was four, you know, I stopped listening to what my mom told me to do, and I wouldn't eat the green beans, and I wouldn't, you know, and when I was six, well, then I went to grade school, you know, kindergarten, and then I, and then, you know, and you get this whole, like, every event in your life until, you know, and they're wondering at this point, you know, it's like, you know, okay, you know, how old are you? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it through this, right? <laughs> um, this is what you had to, you had to pick one event, two events in your life, and, and, and focus in on those. You might save the other ones for another testimony. You know, you can have more than one testimony, but each one needs to have some crispness to it. Avoid glorifying sin by giving too much detail, like I said before, and make it age appropriate. There might be some things you might not say if you're speaking to children or if you're speaking to, uh, to people in high school. You might have a couple different versions of your testimony to preserve uh, the innocence of others. Avoid Christian lingo, hallelujah, bo I was born again, right? It's like, you might know what that means. It might be true, but they might have no clue, and it might actually turn them off. So you have to be careful, the, the lingo creeping in. Uh, don't blame everyone else for all of your problems. Be very careful about how much you reveal about other people's insufficiency. It's not like you can't mention it at all, but, but do it with uh, respect for those um, so that you don't uh, condemn others. Take responsibility for, for your actions. And avoid, in, if you're going to have an invitation at the end, avoid being too confrontational with it. You've got to do this, or you've got to, you know. It's like, well, you know, invite. Don't, uh, don't condemn or confront someone. Also avoid exaggerating for effect. It can kind of be easy without realizing it to kind of, you know, hype up the story sort of more than it was, you know. <laughs> it's like... Uh, even, even without intending to. So sometimes we need to use nuanced language about how the Lord got through to us. You know, I, when I use my testimony, for example, I had this experience of Jesus on the cross. And I said, it was like I was on Calvary. And then I say, in my heart, I saw Jesus on the cross. You know how very carefully I worded that? Because it wasn't a visual, like a vision, right? So I qualify it with, in my heart, I could see. That's an example of using nuance for how God is interacting with you. It's very difficult to describe these things, but we have to try. This is the, the heart of the testimony. 